Hey y'all, it's your math teacher, Mr. Boyden, back at it again, because today we get to talk about the binomial theorem. <clears throat> In order to understand what that is, we first need to understand what is a binomial. If you break down the word into bi and nomial, really it means two names or two terms, okay? Like bi, like a bicycle, right? So with that underway, let's take a look at what happens when we expand binomials and see what patterns occur when we do that. So what I'm going to have is right here in this space, I'm going to have my answers, and then over here on the right, I'm going to show some work of how I'm getting those answers. Okay, so for the first one, pretty straightforward. Something to the zero power, um, we've talked about that. That's automatically one. Okay, so that one's really easy. What about this one? X plus Y to the first power. Okay, well, that would be X plus Y to the first. The first power doesn't do anything, so that would just be X plus y. And I am going to space these intentionally. I think you'll see why by the time I'm done. What about x plus y squared? All right, time for a little side work. That would be the same as x plus y times x plus y. And we learned back in algebra that we can, I think your teacher probably called it FOIL. I'm going to call it distributing. We can distribute that over and distribute that over. Let's see what we get. x times x is x squared. When we do x times y, we get xy. And when we do y times x, we get xy. So that would be two xy's and then when we go to the next one y times y will give us y squared so there's our simplified form i'll fill that in all right what about x plus y cubed well that's the same thing as this but just multiplied by x plus y again so i better do a little bit of side work again so what do i get when i do that i get x plus y multiplied by my previous result x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. Don't forget the parentheses now. Okay, and let's start multiplying those out. So first, I'm going to distribute the x throughout this trinomial. See, binomials 2, trinomials 3. I'm going to distribute the, the x. So I get x cubed plus 2. And the x, when you multiply by x again, will become x squared. So 2x squared y plus xy squared. All right, so that's that's distributing the x. Now let's distribute the y. So now I get an x squared y when I do that. I'm going to line these up so I can see them easily. I get an x squared y, and I'm going to bring the y down to here. So I get a 2xy squared. And guys, notice I'm going to put them in order, like in the alphabet, right? Multiplication's commutative, so I can change the order. It's easier to see if we keep them in order alphabetically. Okay, it's just an organizational technique. And then distribute the y down to y squared, and I get y cubed. And then we'll combine our like terms. So what do I get? I get x cubed plus, okay, that there's two of those and one of those. So that would be plus 3x squared y plus, there's a 1 there. So that would be 3xy squared plus y cubed. All right, let's fill that in over here. All right. Now, what if we jump from the third power to the twelfth power? That's not actually a very pleasant exercise, having to multiply this through a whole bunch more times. And you may have noticed, doing it for something that's cubed is a lot more work than something that's squared. Um, so really, I don't want to do that. What I want to do is this. I want to look for patterns, and I want to see if there's a shortcut that I can figure out to figure out something like x plus y to the twelfth, so I don't have to do all the steps every time. So this may be a good place to pause the video and start to notice the things that you see in terms of patterns here that would allow us to maybe find like x plus y to the fourth without doing a whole bunch of extra work because it becomes really, really cumbersome. So you may want to pause the video now and try that. Here's what I hope you noticed. I hope you noticed that the coefficient out here is always one. And the coefficient out here is always one. And if we take off the coefficients, and that means the numbers that are in front, okay, then what do we get? We get one, 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 two, one, one, three, three, one. So what patterns do we see there? I'd like you to notice, yes, the outside number is always one. How do we get the next number in the list? Like for example, one plus two is three. 1 plus 2 is 3. 1 plus 1 is 2. So what would that tell us the next number down would have to be? 3 plus 3 is 
6. And it turns out, if we actually do the work on the fourth power, that's actually true. Okay, what about if we get this term here? 1 plus 3 gives us 4, and 3 plus 1 gives us 4. And what will the numbers on the outside be? Well, they're always 1. Okay, so what is this? This is often referred to as Pascal's triangle. Pascal's triangle. And it's something that you can generate on your own. Some people say, oh, how am I going to memorize all the numbers? Y'all, it's really easy. You just remember the outside numbers, 1, and then I'm going to add the next 2 to get the next number. So 1 plus 4 gives me 5, and 4 plus 6 gives me 10, and 6 plus 4 gives me 10, and 4 plus 1 gives me 5, and then I get a 1 out here. So generating the next row is actually quite easy. Okay, It's not that big a deal. Um, let's go back down and see what other patterns we notice. The next one that I want you to see is a little bit easier to see if the things that don't have an exponent on them, if I put a 1 on them so we can see. It. So maybe I should do that in a different color so it shows up differently. So put little ones, one, 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 one. Okay, here's the next thing I'd like you to notice. If you look at any individual term, so like this is a term, this is a term, and this is a term, what can you notice about all the exponents? The exponents will always add up to this number. Let's test that. This is x squared, 2 matches 2. 1 plus 1 matches 2. 2 matches 2. What about down here? 3 matches 3. 2 plus 1 matches 3. 1 plus 2 matches 3. And 3 matches 3. Okay, so that's a pattern that will hold up. Those will always add together. There's one more pattern that's really important, and that's this one. You can see it down here in the third row. This starts out with x cubed, and then x squared, and then x to the first, and then there isn't any x at all. So that's that thing that comes first, that first term in the binomial. If you count the other direction, it goes y cubed, y squared, y to the first, and then y is gone. That pattern will hold up. So that's useful when we want to write down something like x plus y to the fourth. It, by incorporating Pascal's triangle and that pattern we just observed, we can say, well, okay, the first thing's going to be x to the fourth. And then using these numbers, it goes 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. So that was the 1. There's going to be a 4. There's going to be a 6. There's going to be a 4 and there's going to be a 1. Now what do we know about the x's? It goes x to the 4th, x cubed, x squared, x, and then the x disappears. What about the y? The y starts out as y to the 4th, y cubed, y squared, and y. Then all I have to do is come back and drop the pluses in between. So once we recognize the patterns, that's a lot less work than what we were doing previously by distributing and multiplying and hopefully not making too many mistakes as we do that. I do want to check really quickly. Remember we said that the numbers in any one term, the exponents would add up to this given exponent. Let's see. 4 is 4. 3 plus 1 is 4. 2 plus 2 is 4. 1 plus 3 is 4. And 4 is 4. So that holds up. Now I'm not going to put us through the exercise of going all the way down to the 12th row because well, if we get the pattern so far, all we'd be doing is doing it in a very long example, and I don't think that's worth our time. I included this here to see, well, if we had to do something like that, is there a faster way? And yeah, there absolutely is. So what is that faster way? That comes from something called the binomial theorem, and it's a way of finding any given term of any expanded binomial. Even if the exponent is 27, we can still quickly, or relatively quickly, go and find any term that we would want of that. Okay, this is attributed to Sir Isaac Newton, um, and actually he came up with it as a way of helping to derive something in calculus, which he was working on at the time, which if you stick around for the calculus series, there'll be a more in-depth explanation of that. But for now, um, we're going to take it for what it is. What I want you to see from all of this math is that it holds all the patterns that we just talked about. Okay, it starts out with this first thing to that power, right? Like we had x to the fourth in the example we just did. Okay, from there, the pattern goes that the exponents will go in descending order. So n then an n minus 1, 1, 2, skip a few. There'll be some in the middle. We're continuing to decrease the exponent. And in the end, that a isn't even there. The same thing works backward. You have b to the power that was given, and it just works backward until there's just a b, and then there's no b at all. And then Newton found a way of expressing all of those coefficients, and he calls it a binomial coefficient. Okay, we're going to talk about that in just a second. For now, just get this down in your notes. Okay, and the one thing that I want you to know, especially as an IB learner, someone who's preparing for the IB exam, um, the thing that is most important is this right here. It's like in our previous video when I said with all those laws of logarithms, you don't necessarily need to plug numbers into them. You need to see them as a reminder that you can express multiplication as addition and so forth. All this is is saying, hey, 
yeah, that's how the first one goes. That's how the second one goes. But if you want to find any term, this little chunk right here is really all you're looking for. So we'll get to some examples of that in just a minute. Okay, the, if there are some notes here that n relates to the rows number of Pascal's triangle and that r relates to the term number. The only trick is it starts at r equals zero. So this is like the zeroth term, the first, and so on. Okay, so we talked about that really briefly. That we say that typically n choose r as in like n select r. So n choose r that comes from combinatorics. So it is sometimes called a combination or a binomial coefficient. The way it's calculated is with these factorials and that is the biggest reason why we did factorials back in our prior lessons okay so you may want to jot down that notation um, we practice simplifying things like this this actually is a simplified form there's no way to simplify it any further so let's not waste our time on that and then um, please don't pay attention to this little box this is the alternate notation that's used in fact um, most simple calculators will have a button on it that looks like ncr so that'd be like n choose r is how we'd say it. The other thing I want to point out, this is not a fraction, okay? There's no fraction bar in there. And that to me looked really strange when I first saw it, but uh, understand it means something very different than a fraction versus this over here has a fraction in it. So we have to be intentional about whether or not we use that bar, okay? If we have that definition down, which I think we do, let's practice using it, okay? So let's do this example down here on the bottom of the screen, eight choose two. So all we're going to do, I'm going to put in the fraction bar exactly like it says right here. And then I'm going to plug in the numbers. So the top number n goes right there. So I'm going to have 8. And it says to put 8 factorial. What about the bottom? n choose r. Well, that's n and r goes in that order. n and r in that order. So that would be 8 minus 2 factorial. And then they want r factorial next to it. So that would be 2 factorial. And then we get to simplify it out. So I'm actually going to write the whole one out because the numbers aren't very big. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Don't forget to put something there that says they're multiplied. And then this is 6 factorial. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And that's a 1, 2. And now it's simplification time. So I suspect that you probably already see that the 1 through 6s are all going to cancel out. Pew, pew. You can probably tell that the one isn't doing anything because it's multiplied and divided by one. The easiest way to do this, some people will multiply that together and 50, get 56. I don't find that to be quite as easy. What I do is I do eight divided by two. So then that says seven times four. And we know that that's 28. Now, if you have a calculator in front of you, find the NCR button on it or find how you do. In some calculators, it'll actually say the word combination in a menu, like in a TI Inspire, it says that. So if you want to go find that, you can type it in. Usually what you'll have to do is hit the eight first, then the combination button, and then the two. And sure enough, I'm sitting here with my calculator as I make this video, it pops out a 28. So that's all that is. Let's practice a few more of these. Let's get good at them. Okay, so I've got these two here. And maybe you're ready to pause the video and try it on your own. Okay, here's how it goes. We get a five factorial on top, a five minus five factorial right there. And then we get a five factorial there. If we remember that five minus five is, well, we know five minus five is zero, of course, but zero factorial is one. So we're multiplying by one. And then you have something divided by itself is always one. So that one was pretty easy. What about 14 choose 13? On this, we'd have 14 factorial over 14 minus 13 factorial. Don't forget your parentheses. And then we would have 13 factorial down there as well. So what do we have then? We've got a 14 factorial and a 13 factorial and a one factorial. Okay, so all the principles that we learned when we simplified factorials previously will still apply here. We remember that one factorial is one, so that does nothing. Goodbye, see ya. And then I don't wanna write all the numbers one to 14. I only have so much life to live and I'm not gonna spend it doing that. So one times two times, wait a minute, I've just violated the principles. Remember I said the principles of factorials will apply. And so what we learned is you always want to start with the smaller one. Okay, so 13 it is. So one, two, skip a few, 13. Okay, that's one times two. Keep that pattern going until you get to 13. That's what 13 factorial is. So now make a match, but keep going until it's true. So we put the 14 as well. Everything one through 13 cancels out. And so our answer is 14 on that. 
All right, now that we know that, let's practice the skill of expanding using Pascal's triangle. And then we'll try to put those, those different pieces together. Okay, so first I want to remember what Pascal's triangle is. 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. And y'all, just so you know, that's about as far as I have memorized. Um, it, remember, it's easy to generate. 1 plus 2 is 3, and that pattern continues on all the way down. So now let's apply that here. If we have to expand this one, well, we already did this one earlier in the video, but we did it through algebraic distribution. Now we're going to do it via Pascal's triangle. So I just find my row that has a 3 in it. Pew! So they match. And then I go 1, 3, 3, 1. And then it goes x cubed, x squared, x, and zippo. And then we have y. We're going to work y in the other direction. y cubed, y squared, y, and nada. And then we're going to put our pluses in. And that is very literally all it is. Okay. Now, the reason I've picked these other examples is because everything we've looked at so far is x and y. I want you to see what happens when there's a number. And I want you to see what happens when there's a minus. Okay, so the start is the same thing. One, three, three, one. In fact, for both of these, it's going to be one, three, three, one, because they're referring to the same row of Pascal's triangle, or we are referring to the same row of Pascal's triangle. The x's are going to work the same way. X cubed, x squared, x and nothing. X cubed, x squared, x and nothing. Here's where it gets a little different, though. Now we're going to have one cubed, one squared, one, and nothing, and we're still going to put our pluses in. So what's different about it? Well, we have the option to simplify it now. So one x cubed is x cubed. This one multiplying by one does nothing, so we still have three x squared. Here we have one squared. Okay, well that still doesn't really do anything, so we just have three x. And then down here, one cubed times one is still just one. Okay, so still pretty simple. But it gets a little different when there's a minus or a negative because you have to think about what each thing is in the binomial. The first thing or the first term here is x, the second one is y. Here the first one is x, the next one is 1. Here the first one is x, the next one is not 1, it's negative 1. So what we do down here, we put a negative 1 cubed and a negative 1 squared and a negative 1. And it seems like that doesn't make much difference until you realize that that's going to make this alternate. Let's simplify it and see. Okay, 1 times x cubed is x cubed. And right here, I have negative 1 times 3. We do need to simplify those numbers together. So I get minus 3x squared. And then here, negative 1 squared is positive 1. So that stays positive. So 3x. And then down here, negative 1 cubed. Remember, odd exponents leave it negative. So that is a minus 1. So notice the difference. This alternates as opposed to the previous one, which did not. So that's a mistake a lot of people make when they're just learning this, and I wanna make sure we point that out to you here. Now, what if you get a really exciting one like this? Expand 2x minus 3y to the fifth. I'm gonna go back up to Pascal's triangle and realize, hey, I need a fifth row, so let's fill that in now. So it'd be one, one plus four is five, and four plus six is 10, and six plus four is 10, and four plus one is five, and it always ends with a one. All right, so now that I have those, I'm going to fill in my coefficients down here on the bottom of the page. So 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, and 1. And now is where we're going to have just a little bit of fun. So let's do it. So our first term is 2x. So I'm going to get 2x to the fifth, and it has to go in parentheses, y'all. Because, look, 2 is part of the term, so 2 needs to also be raised to the fifth power. And then we're going to have 2x to the fourth, 2x cubed, 2x squared, and 2x. All right, now we're going to deal with the 3y. So that would be a negative 3y to the fifth, a negative 3y to the fourth, negative 3y to the third, negative 3y squared, negative 3y. And then if you have different colored pencils or pens, you might consider um, putting in 
your addition symbols with a different color. Otherwise, you run the risk, at least for some people's brains and some people's eyes, this starts to look like just a big old train of symbols and it starts to jumble together. We really want to see different chunks or different terms of math here. Okay, so I want to check myself really quickly. I want to make sure all my exponents do truly add up to 5. So let's see. 5 is 5. 4 plus 1 is 5. 3 plus 2 is 5. 2 plus 3 is 5. And 1 plus 4 is 5. And 5 is 5. So yes, I'm good. Now all we need to do is simplify it. So this is the first one where we've really had a number other than 1 in these spots. So I want to show you what happens when we get that. So what we do down here, the 1 does nothing. We do have to raise 2 to the 5th power. And so I'm going to do that now. So I get 32 x to the fifth. All right, that was the first term. That's not bad. What about the next one? Here we have three different numbers we have to multiply together. We have five, we have two to the fourth power, and negative three. I'm going to use a calculator for this one. So five times two to the fourth times negative three, and I get negative 240. So actually what I'm going to do here, I'm going to put a minus there. So minus 240. Now the x is still to the fourth, and then there's a y. Now my next one, the negative gets squared, so I feel comfortable putting a plus already, so I will. Now I need to multiply the numbers together. So I need to multiply 3 squared, or negative 3 squared, and 2 cubed, and 10. So this one we probably do mental math, because we know that 3 squared is 9, and 2 squared is 8, and then we're going to multiply that by 10, and we get 720. Looks like the x is cubed and the y is squared and we can probably already see that it's alternating so I'm gonna put a minus here it's really easy to change a minus into a plus so it's not a big risk let's see a negative cubed is negative so yeah it's gonna be a negative there so we get negative 3 cubed and we're gonna multiply that by 2 squared so 4 and that times 10 and so I get 1080 is my coefficient and then it looks like the x is squared and the y is cubed. We keep going. So it was negative, positive, negative. So positive it is. And calculator time, 3 to the 4th multiplied by 2 multiplied by 5. And I get 810. And we get an x, y to the 4th. And then our final term, we're going to subtract. We need, we need to know what 3 to the 5th is. That's 243. So that would be 243 why so if you didn't follow the process and this just popped up on the page it would look a little bit frightening we've got large numbers we have all kinds of different exponents working together it's the kind of thing that if you're working at home and your little sister little brother cousin parent whatever sees you working on it you can say wow look how smart i am I mean, just look at all these symbols i'm a genius and so it's kind of fun in that way i hope you see though that the process is not super horrible i mean if you go slowly and you're careful you can absolutely be successful with this so with regard to the IB exam, there is basically always a question. Um, last year was the first year um, that there wasn't much of a question, and in recent years they've been getting more challenging. So what we're going to do now, we're going to go through a couple of the old questions um, and some similar types of questions that you would expect to see um, on either my exam or my quiz um, or the IB exam. So let's try this one. This is a really classic IB exam question. This is the actual question from 2014. So they want us to consider the expansion of x plus 3 to the 10th. They're going to pick 10. They're going to pick a big number, so we could not reasonably multiply it out in our time. Um, we'd run out of time if we did that. So this is the old classic question they would ask. How many terms are there in this expansion? Y'all, here's what they mean. Back at the very beginning, this expansion had one term. This expansion had one, two terms. This one had one, two, three. This one had one, two, three, four terms, and then one, two, three, four, five. So the question is, how could we quickly identify how many terms there are? This was the first power, and it had two terms. This was the second power, it had three terms. The third power brought four terms. The fourth power brought five terms. So y'all, I hope you can see it. All it is, it's the exponent plus one. Always. We have no exception to that. It'll work every single time. So we look at this one. How many terms are there in this one? Well, the exponent's ten. So this is going to be 11. Now we were asked to find the term that contains x cubed. So the deal is, if we wrote out all 11 terms of this, it's going to take too long. Really, a 5 mark question we want to do in 3 to 6 minutes. We don't have time for that. So here's what we do. We're going to go back to the binomial theorem. And we're going to remember this little guy right here. So maybe find that spot in your notes because that's what I'm going to be referring to as I go here in just a second. 
So here's what I'll do. I need to find the term that has an x cubed. Now what we know is that whatever term we have, it'll be a mixture of this, that, and some coefficient. So it's going to have some coefficient that's going to be 10 choose something, and it's going to be x to some power, and it's going to be 3 to some power. That's what we know. Now if you're not too sure about that, let's look back again. Okay, this is saying for any binomial expansion, it's going to be the binomial coefficient, the first term to some exponent, and the second term to some exponent. Now they use n minus r and r. I'm not going to make a huge deal about that. The only thing I want it to be really clear, and I want you to connect this in your notes, is that whatever number sitting here, it's always the same number sitting there. They're both r. Okay, and all this n minus r and r stuff says is if you add them together, they got to add up to n. That's all that means. Okay, so I'm going to go back down here. And in this question, they were nice enough to tell us that the exponent on the x has to be 3. Now, if that's a 3, what exponent has to go on the 3? Remember, they have to add up to 10, so that has to be 7. And I just told you a minute ago, this number always matches that number. So that's my whole setup. That's by far the hardest part, because from here what I'm going to do is I'm going to go right to the calculator. I'm going to type in 10 choose 7, which is 120. And I'm going to type in 3 to the 7th power, which is 2,187. And then there's still an x cubed, and I'm going to have to multiply those together, so times 120. And I get 262,440 x to the third. So just as that one we had to the fifth power had some really big coefficients in it, so does this one. But I hope you can see it's not a very long question if you realize what to do. And that's what the binomial theorem's for. It's really for finding individual terms rapidly with the help of a calculator. And granted, Newton didn't have a calculator, but we do. So we're going to take advantage of that. Y'all, that's all this one's asking for. What about this one? Very similar. I would encourage you on this one, since it's a very similar question, pause the video, try it on your own. And then when you're ready, hit play. Here's how we do it. How many terms are there in the expansion? That's a five, so there's six. Down here, I'm going to write down my coefficient, so 5 and something. There's going to be an x and a 2. They told us the x is to the third power, which means the 2 has to be to the second, so they add to 5. If that's a 2, this is a 2. It's calculator time. So 5 choose 2. I see that that's 10. And then 2 squared is 4, so what I'm going to have is 40x cubed. That's all. What about when we get to a question like this one? Now we're going to up the difficulty level just a little bit. So again, I think it would be useful if you've been tracking well so far to pause the video and try it on your own. Um, this little symbol here is telling us, hey, please feel free to use a calculator. You don't have to do it without, or you probably shouldn't do it without. So we'll use the calculator. And here's how it goes. Third term in the expansion is 252x to the sixth. Find all possible values of k. So instead of a number here, they've given us a variable. But they still did tell us the term. I mean, they even told us what the coefficient was. So they've just given us different information. Here's how I approach it. If I'm going to find a missing term, I know it's going to have a binomial coefficient. And since that's an 8, I know n is 8. I know it's going to have an x raised to some power. I know it's going to have a k raised to some power. And they told me that it was going to be x to the 6th, which means k, since they have to add to 8, has to be squared. And remember, if that is a 2, this is also a 2. They also told me that it is, is almost always translates to an equals, y'all. So they told me that is 252x to the 6th. So I'm going to proceed from here. I'm going to figure out what 8 choose 2 is, and that's 28. So I get 28x to the 6th, k squared equals 252x to the 6th. And I want to start simplifying. We're just doing algebra at this point. So I'm going to divide by, well, let's see. I want to divide by 28 because I want to get k by itself. They asked about what's k. It's like solving. And I'm also going to divide by x to the 6th because it's on both sides and it'll cancel out really nicely. So later and later and later and 252 divided by 28 gives me 9. So I get k squared, ooh, that's nice, equals 9. I can take a square root of both sides, and a lot of people will say, hey, that means k equals 3. Certainly, 3 works. But they said the possible values. Okay, they're giving us a hint in the question, like, wait a minute, if you say 3, you're forgetting something. So what you need to remember is if we make the decision to introduce a square root, that's going to be a plus or minus 3.
Okay, so either the positive or negative would satisfy that. And that's done. So that one's a little bit more technical. It's a little bit harder than the ones we've done so far, but it is something that these skills will allow us access to. All right, and now we'll bump the difficulty up even a little more, okay? And this is gonna be our last one today. This is about as hard as they get, to be honest with you. Um, if you can understand to do this one, you're in really good shape. So it's similar to the one we just did. Consider the expansion of some binomial. Notice that this is here. A lot of students don't notice that at first because we've never seen anything like that where there's something multiplied outside, so be careful. We're told the constant term is 20,412. Now when they say constant term, what they mean, they mean the term that doesn't have a variable in it. There's no x in this one. So what we have to do is we have to figure out what the form of that term looks like, and then we're going to solve it algebraically just like the last one. So I'm going to pull this, and I'm going to try to write out what any term would look like. So it would have an x, and then it would have a binomial coefficient with a 7 as n, and it would have a 2x squared in it, and it would have a k over x. So now all I have to do, oh, and we know that that's going to equal 20,412. And so what I have to do now is I have to select my exponents here and there that add up to 7 in such a way that all the x's cancel out. So if you're brand new to this, which I'm assuming you are because you're watching this video, what we normally would do is we could try to think about it. For a lot of students, they end up just guessing and checking. So for example, what if we chose 3 and 4, what would happen? We can do a little mental math on this. This would say x to the 6th times that would be x to the 7th. We'd be dividing by x to the 4th. So that doesn't cancel out. That's not what I want. So we could try something else. Like maybe we could try the second power and the fifth power. Let's see. That would be x to the squared squared. So that'd be x to the 4th times x would be x to the 5th dividing by x to the 5th. It seems plausible that that works, so I'm going to proceed and see if we run into any, any roadblocks. Remember, if that one over here is a 5, this is also a 5. So let's try it. What I have now is I have 2 x to the 4th. I have my x here. Let's figure out what 7 choose 5 is. It looks like that's 21. Don't forget your parentheses. And actually, there's another mistake I've made. I don't know if you noticed it. It's right here. That's not actually a 2. And the reason for that is right here, this 2 is now getting squared. So that is a 4. Okay. So then the x squared squared is, is 4th as well. And then what do we have down here? We have k to the 5th. And the x is also to the 5th. And that's going to equal 20,000. 412. Now we want to pause and make sure we're on the right track before we go any further. So let's see, I have x times x to the fourth, that's x to the fifth, that will divide by x to the fifth, so that stuff's going to cancel out. Now y'all, I am going to show that step, okay, because for most of you this is brand new, but you wouldn't need to show this next step if you didn't want to. Okay, x times x to the fourth is x to the fifth. I have a k to the fifth. We have an x to the fifth there. And then I'm going to do 21 times 4. So I'm going to put my 84 out here in front. Now the only reason I'm showing that is so you can see clearly that these are going to cancel out. So those cancel out. I'm going to divide both sides by 84. So let's see, 20,412 divided by 84. We hope that comes out evenly. It does. That's 243. And that equals k to the fifth. So how do you get rid of the fifth power? With the fifth root. All right, now we have to make sure we know how to type in the fifth root. That would be 243, because many calculators are not going to be very friendly in doing that. So what I like to type in, I re-express that as the one fifth power. So I'm going to type that in now, 243 to the one fifth power. And what do I get? I get three. So k equals 3. The one thing we want to check is, hey, is it also negative 3? The deal is, y'all, um, when you take a root, yeah, it'll produce two answers, but only if it's an even-numbered root. This is an odd-numbered root. It's a fifth root. Square root is a second root, so that's a 2. That's why we get two answers. Okay. Fourth root, we'd have two answers, but this one we don't. So what did they ask for? Consider the expansion. The constant term is this. Find k. We found k, so we're done.
All right, y'all. Hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you enjoyed the practice, and we'll see you next time.